Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, privileged to be um, given a slot to lead one of these TD convos. And I think uh, if you don't agree with anything else I say today, I think we're going to be in TD. Uh, well, from anything else. Um, this is going to be a bit of an experiment. Um, um, I'm going to be sharing some thinking in progress. I'm going to be uh, talking about Gen AI and the, the, the shock to the system that has been in higher ed. Well, not just higher ed, but specifically. But I'm trying to enlarge the picture to, to talk about the poly crisis unfolding, the meta crisis, whatever the heck that is, and whether that means we might have a uni crisis. That's us. <laughs> so just playing, just playing with poly, meta, and uni there. Um, this is how it's going to go, roughly. Okay. Ten minutes rapid fire provocations from me. Ten minutes breaking you into some groups to to discuss. And Shivani will split you into breakouts in Zoom if you want to join on those. Um, and then an invitation for feedback. And then we'll move on to the next topic. And we're going to cover JAI and HE, the poly crisis, the meta crisis, and whether that provokes any sort of crisis for us as a university. Okay. Um, no obligation, but there's going to be there's more people here who are going to have more interesting thoughts than can be shared in the limited time we have right now. So there is a Google Doc running here um, at bit.ly slash tdconvo, and um, you're very warmly invited to share thoughts, links, anything else that occurs to you, either during the session, but totally fine if you just want to prioritize face-to-face -face interaction here and on Zoom. And you can drop stuff in afterwards. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, so this is how we're gonna go. Let's start off. Some lightning history, 1966, one year before I was born. And we have a character called Joseph Weizenbaum. Anybody heard of Joseph Weizenbaum? A couple of fingers going up. Okay. Um Joseph Weizenbaum invented something called ELISA. What was ELISA? It was a computer program for the study of natural language communication between man and machine. It was only men that talked to machines then, sorry. Um, what was ELISA? This is, uh, this is actually Weizenbaum City at ELISA. That was the computer it printed out on paper. But uh, somebody finally created an emulation of ELISA which is a mock Brugerian psychotherapist. And if you haven't seen, here's a, an extract from the transcript. Um, Eliza, this is something from the new. You. Men are all right. Eliza, what's the connection, do you suppose? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Is it important to you that your boyfriend made you come here? He says, I'm depressed. And so we go. This is emulating interaction style from Rogerian psychotherapy using an extraordinarily simple set of rules, but it was state of the art at the time. Okay, what happened? That was 66. In 76, Weizenbaum wrote this book, Computer Power and Human Reason. He was profoundly, profoundly disturbed by the power of this kind of dialogue. Once my secretary who had watched me work on the program for many months and therefore knew it to be merely a computer program, started conversing with it. After only a few interchanges, she asked me to leave the room. <laughs> That's a great what I have not realized is that extremely short exposures to a relatively simple computer program could induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. Right? Fast forward. November 22, and the launch of ChatGPT. Okay. The Eliza effect is here, well and healthy. Very compelling, of course, much more compelling than Weizenbaum's simple Eliza program, and educators the world over are scrambling. And um, we'll see more of the Eliza effect in a month. So, very quickly, I could spend the next 90 minutes just talking about what is happening now in the world of education and ChatGPT and all the other bots, but 
super fast, right? GPT-4 can now pass the US beautiful bar exam for lawyers. Doesn't mean you want a bot to be your lawyer. <laughs> it can pass the exam. So interesting questions about the relationship between assessment and practice. If I ask perplexity, um, those of you that use used perplexity, yeah, so it's a, a natural language search engine, it's a chatbot, but for it's indexing the scholar literature. So it's a completely new way of doing what you might have used to do with Google Scholar. What is the evidence about the impacts of ChatGPT in education in 2024? You know, we've got eight months publications now out there, and uh, it's a mixed story. There's some positive reports and some negative reports. I'll just make a note. Really important questions emerging here about the extent to which researchers are trusting summaries and papers, whether HDRs, how we are training our HDRs to read, yeah, to what extent does an agent bot read between the lines in a paper? Mm. Not very well. Um, these are the skills that our, our researchers must not lose. Right? But many, many people are using these kinds of summarization agents instead of reading papers themselves. Here at UTS, we are providing secure GPT-4 for all students through Bing Copilot integrated. Uh, so that's, you know, that's uh, Copilot, GPT-4, and 3.5 integrated with Bing Search. And we are going to be piloting some custom UTS chatbots this semester as well, running in our own secure enterprise A environment. So the data is not going anywhere. Sessions are logged, authenticated access, uh, and um, who Luis and Giovanni in here at Giddy School will both be piloting this with, with their students. Okay, what else is going on? Um, it's getting increasingly multimodal and embedded in mobile phones. Um, some links there for you to follow. Anybody talk to an AI bot or had, had it talked back to them? Um, let's, let's give it a go. I've got um, Pi running here, which is PI AI. You can see that here. Um, let's see if she's here. Bye bye. Um, are you there? Hi. I'm here in. Uh, oops, hang on. Let's just play here. Okay, there you go. It's quite a move to get there. Okay, I'm, I'm in a meeting with some university colleagues and we're talking about. Transdisciplinary ways of thinking about AI and education. Bit of a delay. That sounds like an interesting meeting. Transdisciplinary approaches can really open up new ways of understanding and solving complex problems in education. What are some of the specific issues you're discussing? <laughs> well, we are fascinated by the extent to which um, AI is part of the poly crisis, the many crises that are affecting society now. Thanks. Question. I lost that. <laughs> in fact, in fact, there is a long response from her in text because everything is text as well. But for some reason, the voice synthesis didn't go. But for those of you who haven't heard, you know, the voice synthesis quality is possible now. You're getting pauses, you're getting ums and ahs. If I was to express my grief at the quality of the grade I just received in my assignment, it would be super sympathetic. It's been designed to be emotionally engaging and to foster long-term relationships. Okay. Oh. Right. And uh, by the end of this year, Microsoft will probably have released an upgrade. They bought Pi. They bought Inflection. Inflection was developed by, by uh, Mustafa Suleiman, who created DeepMind. And he's now head of AI at Microsoft. And Google have played some demonstration videos of what's coming out from their version AI as well, where you can interrupt. The latency is almost down to zero. AI is being pushed down to the phone now, so you don't need to apply for that. Right? So this has just become normal business. Yeah. Completely different from um, test, testing. Okay, 
Uh, let's see if I can get my mouse on the screen here. Uh, where's my mouse gone? Oh, is it up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't see. Oh, there it is. Okay, here I am giving a talk. UTS video. Welcome to the UTS Learning Journeys website. This exciting resource has been created to help students. So I don't speak English. My first language is. Uh, this is a nightmare. French. That's. What? And the personnel of all levels. <laughs> Emulating my voice and the same thing, especially this channel. The future is reserved. Should your first language just become an irrelevant and future where you can see this? Yeah. Any student can just play any useless video in Chinese, Japanese, whatever they Language. That's the interesting prospect. Okay, now that was me, it wasn't an emulation of me video, that was my original video, but it had swapped out my audio. Uh, there's an academic in business school who doesn't want to be on videos, so it's created a super hyper realistic avatar of just another woman that she would prefer to be presenting the videos. These days, we can blame someone for not necessarily wanting to be on the internet. Okay. Replica, the AI companion who cares. Um, if you go to replica.com, you will see testimony after testimony from people for whom this is one of their best, most closest, supportive friends. Right? It's an avatar, obviously you can design their clothes and personality. Interesting. Um, Stanford study just came out. People are talking about this as a friend, a therapist, an intellectual mirror. 3% of these 1,000 students surveyed said it was halting their suicidal ideation. This is, we have a loneliness epidemic on, people don't have anyone to talk to. For these students, it's their bot. We have an interesting discussion about whether we think that's good or bad. Okay, moving quickly on. So I'm just throwing these examples and you will see some more later on. The cheating crisis, of course, has grabbed headlines the world over. Since when was educational assessment frontline news on CNN? <laughs> and, I mean, it's been ridiculous, right? Um, one way of thinking about this is, you know, is how we are assessing learning fit for purpose in these turbulent times? This is the, the, the longer term question. This is strategic. Roy P., um, I'm privileged to know at Stanford, um, in 1985 wrote about intelligent systems as he was just envisaging the possibility. There are two kinds of ways of thinking about creative okay? tech. One is what he was calling pedagogic systems, which are focused on cognitive self sufficiency. That is, what are you able to do when you're home without technology? Contrasted with tools that allow you to do amazing things that you could never otherwise do. Which is why AI is making an impact out there in the world of work. So he said we need to distinguish between systems in which the child, he was talking about children addressing conference on Piaget and child development, contexts in which the child uses tools provided by the system to solve problems that he or she cannot solve alone. Cognitive or quick augmentation. What is the system and the machine able, the human and the machine able to do as a whole system versus a system which is establishing that the child really understands how to do something and they could do it with a pen and paper, for example, on their own. So the question for us now is what do we think we're doing when we introduce Gen AI? Are we trying to create a system which is an augmented human computer system able to do astonishing things that can't be done by humans alone? Or are we trying to teach students stuff that eventually we're going to take the tech away and we need to know you can do this in pen and paper because we think that's still so important, you can't be dependent on technology. These are, these are the interesting questions for us. Okay, moving quickly to 
how the sector has responded. Australia is probably a world leader at the moment in this. Texas is our tertiary education policy and standards agency, for those of you don't know. Uh, last year, you know, as we were all scrambling, Texa moved very fast, showing great leadership, convened a whole set of webinars, uh, convened uh, an assessment forum here of 20 experts from across the country, which we hosted here, which was great, out of which came a report on assessment reform for the age of AI, outlining a number of principles and propositions to guide thinking about systemic change in higher education. As far as they're concerned, this is an existential threat to the integrity of university assessment. If we don't know that students actually did what they submitted in whatever that piece of work was, we've got a serious problem. I'm turning out engineers and other professionals, social workers, architects who may not know what we say they know. That's serious. That's a serious breach of the social contract with the university and society. Uh, a more recent report you can look at was you know, that, that previous one, that's long-term systemic change. These are immediate things universities can do. And uh, Texa has required all universities to tell it, credible plan, what are you planning on doing about this? And UTS has submitted a plan, um, uh, which I have to create, and um, this, is, this will be uh, available to you all to take a look at. Um, finally, before we wrap into conversation, um, we need to be talking to our students about this. Students are obviously profound stakeholders in all of this. Many of them are ahead of the game compared to the academics. We need to harness their collective intelligence in this. And we have been engaging quite richly with students here at UTS over the last couple of years, uh, before GI arrived, as well as since then. And uh, I'm now part of a project with other universities which is conducting focus group interviews and a large survey, 4,000 students over the next few months, on what their experiences and perspectives are on AI. That's the AI in Inchi website there. Okay, right, I'm going to stop there and invite you just to break into groups and think about the following proposition. You know, I, I'm going to assert that you can use AI poorly, which would undermine learning, because you're just offloading, the students are offloading far too much to the machine, or really effectively to deepen learning. Um, and my view is that Gen AI is a net positive disruption. So we are in chaos at the moment, which will lead to productive reflection on how we are actually assessing students. And that will ultimately produce improved assessments that should have been revamped many, many years ago, probably. But we got away with it until now. <laughs> so, what insights or concerns you about AI? And would you say your views have changed very much in the last 18 months? So, let's take a few moments just to discuss that, and uh, then I'll call you back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good points. If I was to give you uh, a map, Especially the only generation, and Matt has in one of those big ones <laughs> to navigate by. And I wonder how well you do. Um, you know, our, our own spatial ability is atrophied with sat mm -hmm. right? Okay, all right, so I'm going to move swiftly on here um, because, this, uh, in a sense, uh, most of you will perhaps not have learned that much from what I just said. Right? There's been so much coverage of AI. Right, this is where I really want to move into the new stuff. This is the experimental stuff, and this is the sort of slightly scary stuff for me, because academics don't normally stray that far outside of their disciplinary corridor. That's why we're here, right? So I'm really this is why this is a great topic for the conversation. Because where we are going now is uh, I want to enlarge this into thinking about the polygrosis. I'll explain what that is. Um, AI is just one driver of the many crises that are unfolding in the world now. How does thinking about AI in that context change the way we think about the roles it should play or could play? Yeah, so, let's get moving. Um, polycrisis um, is a, a word, how many of you are even familiar with this word? Can you cross this word? Yeah, about half of you. Okay. Um, 
There's some academic references at the bottom, but here's a summary from World Economic Forum. Present and future risks can also interact with each other to form a polyprocess. A cluster of related global risks with compounding effects, such that the overall impact exceeds the sum of each part. So we're essentially talking about systems interacting with systems, health, security, water, migration, um, breakdown of global rules-based order, AI, cost of living crisis, oh, and the planet's back. Okay, so we go to the global risk report. Um, you can see here, this was conducted last year. 2025, looking two years ahead of the time, top 10 risks as judged by a particular group of experts. Okay. By the way, all these slides will be available afterwards on my blog, so don't worry if you're missing these. Okay, and there's there's a list of happy things. Possibly the crisis is number one. It's number one, right? That, you know, as as they they thought that next year that would still be a global the top global risk ranked by severity, right? Natural disasters and extreme weather, geoeconomic uh, confrontations, failure to mitigate climate change, and it goes down. Let's peer 10 years ahead to 2034. Well, you'd be glad to know the cost of living crisis isn't even there. <laughs> 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 yeah, I put the lines in, you can see what's going up and what's going down. But we've traded cost of living crisis for biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. I'm not sure if that's a good swap or not. So this is a serious list of this. We're all aware of this up here. It's kind of sinking in down here for some of us. Um, it's also big and scary, and what can we do anyway, right? So here's another, here's another scary one. We have transgressed six of the Earth's nine planetary boundaries. Solcar Resilience Center, these are serious Earth system scientists. This planetary boundaries framework update finds that six of the nine boundaries are transgressed, suggesting that Earth is now well outside the safe operating space for humanity. And they hope that this will be a wake up call. And we hear report after report coming out of IPCC, this kind of thing, local news, uh, it's, it's all happening around us. It feels a bit like a sci fi movie. So, no. There are even centers dedicated to the study and mitigation of risks that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse. Any guesses which university this is? One of the smaller ones you may not have heard of, um, yet Cambridge. <laughs> okay, Center for, Cent for the Study of Existential Risk. Wow. And why would humans be studying existential risk? I mean, it's only one of the biggest questions we could possibly ask. Right? And there's a whole lot of science, politics, social science, um, and, and artistic ways of thinking about how we come to terms with these things. AI, of course, is one of the problems. I mean, it's got a huge environmental footprint when we've all these foundational language models. This is a slide from the briefing slides given to all subject coordinators to introduce Gen AI. Um, it talks about a whole bunch of ethical issues which compromise language models. Here's just one of them. It harms the environment. All sorts of calculations on the damage that's done by creating these models. Um, so we want our students to come in eyes wide open as to what's going on. Uh, this stuff does not exist in some floaty cloud up there with no material or social impact. We also talk about the, the you know the, the awful labor conditions under which people are detoxifying these models and so forth. But AI is also being harnessed to try and tackle climate change. A couple of links here to uh, climategpt.ai, uh, a language model trained completely on renewably powered computing, they say and choose to help answer complex questions about future climate scenarios. Or this you know, lengthy review paper on all the different ways that AI could help tackle climate change in one of the top uh, computing journals. So that's happening. It's a double-edged sword, mm. right? We're talking about dual-use technologies here. 
which have positive and negative impacts and have a huge environmental footprint, could be crucial to actually um, making progress. Mm -hmm. um, another way of responding is to pick one of the, the crises, for example, the unraveling of democracy and the rise of the right, okay? Uh, and say, okay, what is the role of the university in, in tackling you know, the, the, the fraying of democracy? And what's the role of AI in that? So we might go to uh, Henri Giroux, uh, Master University, Pedagogy of Resistance, and many other books on why universities are losing their grip on their fundamental role to sustain democracy. It's hard to imagine a more urgent moment for taking seriously ongoing attempts to make education a fundamental element of politics. At stake here is the notion that education is a social concept rooted in the goal of emancipation of all people. And he talks about agency, critical thinking, creating committed individuals and social agents. And there's the rest of the quote talking about the fact that we need pedagogy that calls us beyond ourselves and engages the ethical imperative to care for others, dismantle structures of domination, etc. He was a student of Paolo Freire. Mm -hmm. um, I had the privilege of spending some time with, with him uh, last year. I said to him, Henry, where do you see AI fitting? And he talks about can our platforms be used to combat learned helplessness? Which is what he sees happening in the States. He's written about the right, essentially celebrating ignorance. Yeah. He talks about imagining a future in which AI becomes a fundamental tool for expanding creative, socially responsible agency. I like that link. So, how else might we think about the role of AI in when confronted with a public crisis? Well, it can obviously be used to help people just learn about. Classes. You can use AI to teach people about pretty much anything, I would say, um, um, in terms of mastering curriculum and understanding the possibilities and so forth. Um, we can use AI to challenge the assumptions that got us into the space. I'll give you an example in a moment. We could use it to augment our capacity to engage with complexity. I'm not arguing that we need to stop teaching anything under the sun. Mm. Right, there's a tendency for people to go, oh, we've got a major crisis on, the economy is collapsing, ecosystems are collapsing, why are we still teaching art and dance? Mm. Right, I mean, how's that going to save the world? Sorry. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a tendency to go step. I'm going to argue that we absolutely can't afford to do that. But we do need to be teaching about systems thinking and emergence. And how you make a difference in your local community when it feels so overwhelmed. Right? We have eco anxiety, which now I think, and you can blame the young people for being anxious. Um, could it augment our creativity? I'll show you one example to provoke your thinking. Could it augment collective intelligence? Because no one's going to solve this problem on their own. We need we need people of all sorts working together. So, let's just step through a few examples. The poly crisis requires us to question our assumptions. Could uh, Gen AI help? So, um, let's go to... Uh, uh, here we go. Curie Framer. Uh, oh, no. Can't see a thing on the screen here. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Okay. Right, so my friend. Okay. Here's Curie Framer, which is a chat GPT bot, which I built. Um, hello, what's on your mind today? Are there any questions or ideas you're reflecting on that you'd like to explore more deeply? And yes, I'm asking a question here. Okay. How can we ensure that immigrants contribute productively to the communities that welcome them? Hmm. What Curie Framer does is suggest assumptions that lie behind your question. That's what the prompt does. Okay. That's an interesting and complex question. 
To dive deeper, let's start by identifying some assumptions that immigrants are primarily responsible for their own integration and productivity. Is that a legitimate assumption that might be lurking behind the question? That there's a clear and universal standard for what constitutes productive contribution. And that um, immigrants inherently need to prove their value to a community. Okay. DPT4 has no clue, really, what we're talking about. But I have prompted it to surface implicit assumptions behind questions. Right. And I go, oh, okay, yes, let's explore number three. Uh, let's dig into this area further. Um, and it starts to ask some more focused questions that I might be interested in. What factors shape the expectation that immigrants can prove their value? How might this assumption affect the way communities and immigrants interact? What might be unintended consequences, etc. Okay, so you can see where we're going. Um, this is going to be piloted here in QD School and, um, and in some of the other faculties. And um, I'm very interested to see what happens. This, for me, is an interesting example of using a language model to push back, not just give the answer, but actually dig deeper and ask students to think about whether there actually are better questions they could be asking, as well as the assumption that we're going to That's the example I showed. You can use this for real hard science as well. Harry Cutler at the University of Sydney is doing a PhD on diabetes. And there's a question here about the relationship between insulin resistance in the heart muscle and glucose dependent thermogenesis in brown adipose tissue. Okay. I asked him to try this out. And it's coming back with some interesting assumptions and asking him to explore them further. So this is, if we can talk. Theology, politics, whatever you want, okay? And this has not been trained on anything yet, other than this is generic out-of-the-box GPT-4. Okay? I have not trained it on a curated collection of documents yet. Okay, let's think about creativity. Goodness knows we need creativity in the way we're going to solve polycrisis problems. So here's an example from MIT Center for Connected Intel Collective Intelligence. Um, they have a particular methodology which uses the double diamond process, right? You first of all design the right thing, you go through an expansion mode and then a convergence mode, asking, well, what is what is the problem? And then you want to design things right, which you again go through an expansion mode and a convergence mode. Towards a solution. Double diamond process, many of you may be familiar with that. They have a set of moves you can make called supermind moves. Uh, I won't read them all that, but you can see some of them on the screen there. Okay. How would you introduce GPT as another voice in the room? That's all it is. It's another voice in the room for the humans to take on board. Okay. Uh, there's two things that are going, well, there's three things interesting here. Okay. Well, this is about creative ideation. That's of interest for a lot of us. Number two, it's about interface design. So rather than just have a chat interface, it's giving us some clues as to what you can do. So the methodology says that you can, uh, you know, do things like explore the problem or explore solutions. Which one do you want to do? You type in your problem here, and you tell it what you want to do. And we're just signaling to the user what are the available, what are the affordances of the system here. Okay. And then you start to get the natural language responses coming back. So this is a, a trend that we will see where we, we move beyond the chat interface, which if you think about it, is a regression back to the command line interface of old, <laughs> where you have to know the magic to type to get the machine to do something sensible. And making visible to the user with sliders and menus and, and, and other interface widgets that we all are familiar with, what is possible to do within this interface? That's where we're going to be going in the future. The body crisis requires diverse perspectives and expertises. What is it going to look like in the future when virtual teammates are working with us? So I think we're moving towards hybrid human AI teamwork. Students, Working together with an AI, I mean, that's an interesting configuration in itself, where students are talking with each other about what the AI is saying and the AI is contributing. 
maybe listening in and contributing as well in voice. Let's add another AI as well. Let's add several AIs and several more people. Okay. Now we're moving towards larger collective intelligence. Human AI teaming is a well established field already, and of course, they are now getting to grips with generative AI. So, the question for us in the university is how will we teach and assess students on their design and management of Asian teams? How will they orchestrate these hybrid colleagues of theirs? And um, that's something that I'm interested in exploring. Have you ever seen agents talking to each other, by the way? Oh, it's fun. So, <laughs> Here we have uh, an environment, it's called AutoGen from Microsoft. This is running in our secure AI environment. Okay. We've created a toy example where we've got different agents all giving different kinds of feedback on somebody's writing. Okay. We've got a clarity and style agent, a plagiarism uh, agent. We have an agent who represents the author. We have an orchestrating agent who's like a chat manager. Right? And these agents are being told to give feedback. So what you can see here on the right is style and clarity agent talking to the chat manager and saying, you're very welcome. I'm glad to hear the feedback's been helpful. If you have any more drafts, da, 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 da. Um, and uh, then the, uh, the author agent says, thank you for your encouraging words and offers a further assistance. The plagiarism agent comes in and talks, right? So they're just talking English to each other and feeding back. And this is a toy example, but the point is once agents get really complex, you want to compose them and then combine them They'll have well-defined tasks to do. You'll send them off to do something. They'll come back, report back. The point is that they, they speak English now. They're not just talking code to each other. That means humans can actually see what's going on, call them to account, interrogate their responses, etc. So that's a pretty interesting future, one in which we're going to be exploring in December in this symposium on educating intelligence, which you're all very welcome to uh, join online. Okay. Next big slide, the discussion. The poly crisis, I'm going to suggest, shows how much we, humans, need help. We're messing it up big time. We need help. It could be that we need AI to actually think thoughts that humans are not thinking at the moment. It may be that we need to hear something from an AI that we wouldn't take from another person. Students like talking to chatbots because they know there's nothing personal going on. They can ask stupid questions. The AI can be quite firm and challenging in their feedback. It's not personal. Okay. The future is going to require all the richness of human creative intelligence. You know a lot about creative intelligence here in TV school. In combination, I'm going to suggest, with ethical, skillful use of AI. So we're, that's the hybrid collective intelligence. Those who ignore AI may not be able to compete. Okay, this is the sort of exoskeleton me metaphor. You can't compete against somebody in an exoskeleton. They can run faster, lift more, go longer, etc. You can't humanly compete. Right? If we are our graduates are competing for jobs with students from other universities who know how to fly these tools to the limit. And still then add their creative ethical thinking on top of that. Because why would I hire somebody who doesn't have that creative, ethical, out-of-the-box thinking when everybody can use these tools, right? Mm -hmm. Then our graduates are going to struggle. So ETS has an ethical responsibility, I would argue, to create AI fluid graduates. That means knowing when not to use it as well, not being dependent, as we talked earlier. Okay. I'll pitch that to you as a little manifesto. What do you think about that? I'll okay. check. <laughs> Reframe number two, the metacrisis. Are there underlying drivers of the holocaust? How do we express the feelings that we have as we are seeing what's unfolding? What does it mean to stay human as AI grows in capability? Um, this is the most difficult stuff. It's the hardest to talk about. It's also emotionally quite hard. Um, and for me, 
as a matrix. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is kind of where we move into red pill, blue pill land. So I'm going to give you a little taste of the red pill, and then you can decide later if you want to swallow it. Metacrisis. Anybody actually come across that term? Is that something that's in a few million heads? Um, Jonathan Browson is one of the most popular writers about this. It's a, an interesting video called Living in the Meta Crisis and um, an interesting article. He's written a good enough, but prefixing the world is quite good. The Meta Crisis draws attention to interiority, meta as in sense of within, and relationality, meta as a prefix meaning between, as spiritual features of what is typically assumed to be a political challenge. Hmm. Okay, so what's what we're saying here is um, we can frame the poly crisis as just big problems out there we need to tackle. If only we get our politics and technology and smart people act together, we can do it. Okay. The meta crisis is being talked about as something much more profound than just simply getting our shit together and being super effective as problem solvers. He says there's something profoundly wrong with us. Okay, so the word spiritual there is not it's not shorthand for let's all get religion. It's spiritual in the sense of there are deep questions here about who we think we are, how we relate to each other and nature. Um, what what is the meaning of God? We have a meaning crisis on, right? Mental health crisis, all sorts of people are wondering what what is going on. The next generation aren't buying. The narrative of progress and science and the world getting better. Because when you look at your news every morning, that's not a happy scroll. Moreover, highlighting that a fixation with crisis may preclude other and better ways of being in the world. So that's the sense of meta as beyond. And Rousen has written a whole piece on about 10 different senses of meta, which help us explore this strange state that we are in at the moment. So lots of people are trying to get a grip on this, but the idea here is let's not just try and let's 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 the polycrisis systems that are de degrading right now are symptoms of something deeper. So let's not just focus on symptoms, important as relieving symptoms is. Is there something deeper going on here? Which is a fascinating question to ask. Okay. I'm just going to give you little tasters of some of the people who are thinking about this. Uh, Zach Stein is one of them, specifically in terms of education. Okay? So, based on an analysis of long term global trends in economics and political history, contemporary world systems analysts argue that we have reached a crucial moment in geo history. When any complex system reaches its structural limits, an evolutionary crisis ensues, and fundamentally, a new kind of system must be painfully and violently born. Okay, and he's written this interesting book called Education in a Time Between Worlds, which is quite a compelling notion. A time between worlds, it's like the end of one system. We've been born into the end of one system. It started with modernity and the Reformation and science and progress and technology. All of that good stuff is now becoming exhausted, and something is coming into being, but who knows what? And we may or may not survive that. So it's all quite apocalyptic stuff, right? This is quite interesting. <laughs> okay. Interesting essay by Zach Stein about Comenius, this uh, extraordinary thinker and educator and philosopher in the 1600s, who was experiencing a similar transition in his world system. And I encourage you to take a look at that link. This is uh, the cover of his book. He wrote the first kind of multimedia educational textbook of his time. He envisaged just extraordinary things. Right? But he was in this time between worlds. Are you going to share this with us? We yeah, all these slides will be up in that blog uh, by the end of the day. Okay. Uh, Stein has a particular vision of what integral education will look like, and I won't read them all out, but you know, he basically sees the end of traditional schooling. Um, uh, a, a, re, a reset of teacher authority, teacherly authority, but that's not an oppressive thing. That's just taking seriously the fact that people are not, by nature, self-regulated. 
critical thinking teams. Might ring a few bells for those of you who are educators, right? Because there's a role for educators and teachers here, right? Um, critical engagement with the curriculum, uh, whose knowledge is this? I'm being lost to consume. Uh, uh, grounding in, in tech and learning sciences, who can disagree? Using analytics and AI not to build addictive echo chambers, which is what we saw with the social media revolution, but much higher order thinking and reflection on the new programs. And we heard this already um, <laughs> re engaging with people and nature and not screens. All right, so that's uh, Zach Stein on Comenius. Charles Browson, thinking deeply about what it feels and means to be in this time. Vanessa Macado Oliveira, writing from the Global South perspective, Brazilian, but now a professor at UBC Vancouver, hospicing the modernity. An extraordinary book, very, very challenging. Why hospicing? Well, we all know what hospicing means. Acting with compassion to assist systems to die with grace. Support people in the process of letting go, even when they're holding on for dear life towards the word of God. Powerful language. She doesn't pull her punches. If you Google her videos, she's so smiley and gentle. <laughs> you know, she's, she's got a mind and a tongue of raising. Okay. Interrupting self infantilization. The story of this book, The Indigenous Insight. This is very important. I think we need to be starting off looking at this more uh, a little bit. The indigenous insights that we have to call on. Um, amongst all animals, humans are the youngest. Amongst all human cultures, modern culture is the youngest, and we're caught up in a loop of immature, irresponsible, self infantilizing behaviors. It's time to wake up, smarten up, step up, own up, etc. Et and she unpacks. Modernity and the grip that it has on our minds. Modernity is faster than thought. Okay? Modernity predetermines what can be heard, what can be deemed real and possible, what can be imagined as desirable and ideal, how we're supposed to feel, behave, and communicate. It's pre-competent, it's faster than thought herself. And she has a lot to say about Western academia. Because we have so many defense mechanisms within academia to recognizing colonization, essentially. She's writing out of a Brazilian global South perspective. I won't read all of these out, but here are four the denials that she talks about that we will find in Western political thought, Western academic thinking. So it's a very confronting book. Um, this is the sort of red pill thing, blue pill thing I'm talking about. You feel like you're being stripped bare as a Western academic. We found stuff. Okay. Can we use Gen AI, the archetypal child of modern science and big tech, <laughs> right? The point has been made, to help students learn how to critique modernity? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to argue that we need a jujitsu move here, and we're going to use the very tools and technologies that are both driving the dysfunctional behavior to actually teach students to critique and engage with it. Because the technology is not neutral, but it can be used for many, many purposes. Right? So I'm not going to take an absolute stance that says, this is the spawn of the devil. We cannot touch this stuff. What we need to do is recruit it, and appropriate it, and turn it from raw tech into hip tech, and use it in really smart ways to help students deconstruct what is happening to us at the moment. Okay, um, so here's Claude, a chatbot role playing Google Hine, who wrote the Dark Mountain Manifesto. The Dark Mountain Manifesto is quite a bleak piece, chastising the environmental movement for essentially still being hostage to the whole modern story and still um, not coming to terms with our complicity in what's going on. He has made many enemies in the environmental movement. So it's a pretty dark read. Um, read it when you're feeling robust. <laughs> um, a bit like uh, Dolly Vera as well. Okay, but I can ask Claude to take on the persona of Dougal Hunt. 
Okay. I want you to critique the assumptions behind some of the responses I give you to the ecological crisis. Okay. Claude has ingested the entire manifesto and many others of uh, Heinz's writings. And so, obviously, if I ask you what it thinks about striving for net zero by 2025, ah, uh, there it is. We'll sign and sign a technocratic solution with an arbitrary deadline. Let me speak to you, not right. And on we go. Right, so, he's taking on Heinz's voice and is now talking back to me as though I have Heinz in the room. Every university need to, needs to teach the SDGs. Ah, uh, the UN SDGs. <laughs> Another shiny example of our civilized civilizations, misguided, etc. Okay, so okay. now I don't know what I would think about this. You might be very unhappy <laughs> before it's impersonated. I haven't trained for our kind of writings, but it just happens that Claude has read the stuff, right? And he's it adopted a persona, and I can now engage with Hein and have a conversation. And if I was doing that in preparation to write a critical piece about the Dark Man, the Dark Man's Manifesto, well, I've had a proxy conversation with the author. Right? All right, final piece. Modernity's excesses, our myopia, our paralysis is kind of like a collective cognitive dysfunction. It's like collectively as a species, we're stuck. We seem to be paralyzed, and there's a very loud clock ticking. Right? This is not just philosophy. This is not a movie. It's not a dress rehearsal. Somehow we need to act, but we're paralyzed. Okay? That's what happens to patients whose brains are not working. And what I want to talk about finally is the fact that this isn't perhaps just metaphor. So I want to introduce you to some thinking that I know a couple of you here are familiar with. So here's the basic question. Why is the brain asymmetric, deeply divided down the middle, when we know the connections give us intelligence? And why is the corpus callosum largely inhibitory? Why would evolution cleave our brains in half? Ian Gilchrist. He is an extraordinary thinker and writer. He wrote the Master in Zen History about 12, 13 years ago, which was a big uh, popular hit. A uh, short version came out, which you can get for uh, two bucks, just to get the essence. And then in 21, he published this magnum opus called The Mathematical Things Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. He's a cognitive neuroscientist, he used to teach literature at Cambridge, he used to be clinical director at <coughs> the Mortensville Hospital. And he's a philosopher and historian. It's intimidating. <laughs> Whose alarm bells are going off around left brain, right brain, creativity? Okay. The Gilchrist is trying to debunk all of that nonsense pop psychology, you know, the left brain's analytical and reliable, and the right brain is creative, but a bit flaky and emotional. Right? That was a caricature of what is actually genuine neuro, neuroscience evidence about the differences between the left and the right hemispheres. That both are involved in almost everything we do, but they attend to the world in very different ways. So here's an illustration from one of the videos you can watch right now. Right? Essentially, he's arguing that our left hemispheres are specialized evolutionarily to attend with great focus and making the world black and white, evolutionarily, basically, so you can get your lunch. Right? If you are hunting, you need to be able to filter out distractions, focus on the prey, and everything. And it's all about control and power. Okay? On the other hand, if you are not careful, you're going to be somebody's lunch. So the other half of your brain has evolved to constantly be scanning the horizon for unexpected signals, vigilant and alert. And what we're learning, though, is that if you deactivate or have damage to your left or right hemisphere, we start to see how the world appears just to that hemisphere. 
you can deactivate the left hemisphere and ask the patient to draw a flower. You get these very stylized, geometric, archetypal images. If you deactivate the left hemisphere and you've only got your right hemisphere, you can still see the world as a whole. You can still appreciate aesthetics. And down below are figures drawn uh, by somebody, also by people also with left hemisphere, only left hemisphere. And you see that the world is abstracted and it's, a it's, a, it's an abstract representation. It's capturing a sort of essence, but it's really lost the life. There are many, many examples of this. Um, and Miguel Chris, coming back to this picture, um, has taken these modes of thinking, these modes of attention, and expanded and, and basically documented the attributes of each. Okay? That's too small for you to read, you know, meant to, you can read that later. But here's a summary The world is seen by the left hemisphere. Static, isolated, fragmentary elements that can be manipulated easily. Left brain, right hand, typically, right? Left brain, right hand, manipulation, power, control. They are decontextualized, abstracted, detached, disembodied, mechanical, relatively uncomplicated by issues of beauty and morality. Relatively untroubled by the complexity of empathy, emotion, and human significance. It's an inanimate universe and a bureaucrat's dream. This is how bureaucracies work. There is an excess of confidence, a lack of insight. That's the world of data analytics and AI, by the way. So huge risks if we use these technologies badly. Because what he's arguing is that the world has gone this way too far. Right? When you look at the world seen only by the right hemisphere, all is flowing and changing, provisional and complexly interconnected with everything else. Nothing is ever static, detached from our awareness of it, or disembodied. Everything needs to be understood in context, where if it's not to be denatured, it must remain implicit. Humor works through implicit uh, things, for example. You have to explain a joke, you know, you've killed it. The music, art, Implicit, non-verbal, holes are different from the sum of the parts, beauty and morality along with empathy and emotion and depth help us to intuit meaning that lies beyond the, the banality of the familiar and everyday. The left hemisphere loves the familiar and hates the strange and will just filter out things it doesn't expect to see. It's an animate universe and a bureaucrat's nightmare. <laughs> this is why we hate bureaucracy. This is why we hate checkboxes and forms that simplify the world in ridiculous ways. Now, we need both ways. Right? He's written huge volumes of analytical arguments to test. This is not a man who hates science or argumentation or rational thinking. But it's not just a case of balance. This is the interesting point, right? The master and his emissary was called that because he argues the right hemisphere must be the master in control of the left hemisphere, which does extraordinarily useful things, but must report back to maintain the holistic whole. And it's when you don't, when the, the, when the emissary thinks that it's becoming the master, that we get these gross distortions in the way that we think about people and, and, and the planet and so forth, because it just becomes a resource to control and manipulate the mind. And that's his argument. And um, it takes, you know, it's an extraordinary read to see how he takes these two ways of thinking about any situation and talks about philosophical dilemmas, paradoxes, history, collapse of the Roman Empire. I mean, it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's amazing, right? Now, whether or not you buy the neuroscience argument, and I'm not qualified to critique the neuroscience, but many eminent neuroscientists say he has done the best job ever of summarizing where we are at with the, with the neuroscience. Right? These are clearly two very powerful ways of thinking and reasoning, and he's calling for a reintegration of what we used to have before the discipline is splintered, not just science and reason, but intuition and imagination as well, which of course are fundamental to science and reason as well, 
talk about them very much, <laughs> right? Okay. So what does what does McGilchrist have to say about AI? Well, he was invited to give the keynote of the AI World Summit two years ago. They were recognizing he had some important things to say. So he argues, so he already asked, can we scale AI that integrates all four ways of those knowing? That trusts people with a greater agency rather than metricizing them, you know, reducing them to objects that must be manipulated and exploited for their human capital, and reconnects us with each other, nature, and a sense of the sacred as well. Right? Now, if you don't like the sacred word, because it's freaking you out <laughs> again, okay, it's hard to talk about that stuff in academia. We're not talking about religion with a capital R. We're talking about meaning, purpose, uh, awe and wonder, a sense of connection with each other, with nature, maybe with the divine, you want to go there. Let's just remember, if we're thinking seriously, talking with our indigenous colleagues, if we don't want to talk about spirituality and the divine, we're essentially smiling sweetly and saying, yes, yes. You can have your strange beliefs about that, but that's not something I need to engage with. Eighty percent of the world believe in something divine. If you want to do a deep dive into the psychological drivers of the meta crisis, here is Miguel Christ, along with two other amazing thinkers, Martin Berger and Berkeley, talking for three hours at Oxford University. <laughs> what the hell they think is going on? Super interesting when they're in the mood. Okay. We're nearly at four o'clock, and all I can do is put some summary points in front of you, and maybe we can just have an open conversation. We may now be in a time between worlds. That's scary, but it's also kind of exciting. <clears throat> the arts and humanities, I think, are going to have a crucial role to play because we're talking about grieving for something that's failing and potentially bringing something new into view. There's a huge societal learning challenge here, right? And that's obviously a role for universities and therefore a role for AI in my view. While linguistic intelligence, what language models do, are powerful, I'll give you a few examples of conversations. There are other ways of knowing being. We need to be able to transdisciplinary ways of knowing being, and we need to learn from our indigenous colleagues. And I'm very keen to try and open respectful conversations with them because we know it's a fraught business as well to go into indigenous culture and mine it for gems. Mm. Right? That's going to happen. Can we talk about indigenous knowledge systems and AI? Few people are starting to think about that. Fascinating idea. AI can ingest any textual corpus. I've shown you examples which haven't even been trained on a curated corpus. But we can do that now with an ETF. You can, you can give it a curated corpus and it will only answer based on what it finds in that corpus. And it can also engage in many modes of conversation. I've given a couple of examples. So it can help us engage critically, I would say with any narrative to advance any educational mission. I don't think we need to put it in the box of evil things we should not touch. I think we need to appropriate it and bend it to our ends in very smart ways. And the fact that they're run by big tech, big tech is a compromise, but hey, that's life. <laughs> um, and there are also many people talking about open source, Sovereignty over our AI, much more ecologically sound AI as well. So people are working on that stuff. So the closing questions, how do you respond to the above? And does this pose a uni crisis of any sort for us at UTS or anybody else who's listening? What are the implications for what goes on here as a university if we're really in a time between worlds when previous lessons show us that education has such a good role to play in education? Okay, officially that's four o'clock and we should really stop. So I'm going to stop there officially, but we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>